Well, you'll you'll have to send over the video. Yeah. Hey, Joel, how you doing, man? Good. What's happening, dudes? Boy, I've got the worst background out of the bunch here. Well, you've got just, just, <laughs> just go just go into your settings and change them. You know, we, we can we we explain it to all the fine. No, people. good, man. I'm just kidding. It's good. Okay. The, the, the the black background will suffice. The black background will suffice. By the yeah. way, I'm I'm just curious. Uh, when we post this, will you be retweeting this on your uh, socials? Because I'm just I'm just curious. <laughs> or is it going uh, to the Russian Federation? <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll be me. Thankfully, yeah, that was a long couple of days, man. Long couple of days. Oh, but we got we got it sorted out. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's introduce uh, Joel Hoekstra. He's got a new album out. Uh, Joel Hoekstra is thirteen, called Running Games, out on uh, Frontiers Music, February twelfth, uh, twenty. 21 um, hey, Joel, right off the bat let me ask you, you know, a super top 40 radio question how did you come up with the album title running games uh the song the songs were all basically written like all all over the world traveling touring so a lot of it was just about that and so that seemed to be uh the common theme of, lyrically amongst the songs uh, so anyway i rolled with it as an album title and then i wrote the title track actually after the fact so i felt like it needed something to tie it all together at the end and right. I, so yeah that acoustic song at the end came together last Did that happen a lot on the album did you write a title first like a catchy title and then you kind of wrote around that i usually when i write these songs have a have a chorus i usually do i guess chorus out right so i'll, I'll just be riffing and then it, for me it's always a bit much right on the spot to be like and let me write the verse lyrics right now it's more about like let me just get the song going i'll sing a little melody for whatever the verse pre-chorus bridge that thing but the, the chorus is usually a chorus yeah. and uh, guitar player so it's interesting that you start with a chorus because you know normally a guitar player would start with a riff and then go from there. So you're kind of working backwards. And just hold on, uh, Jeremy, your your mic just sort of went funky on us there. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, but it was a little funky, but oh, yes. Is that better? We're, we're good. So yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I was saying, so as a guitar player, it's interesting that you start with the title and the chorus first and then kind of work backwards because usually it's the opposite. I mean, there's sometimes where a riff starts it. There's no like 100% of the time. Uh, I, I'll be riffing with the guitar, but yeah, I find it really hard to not sing a bit while i'm riffing right so for me that i guess the song itself would start with a chorus there are times where their the riffs are kind of happening first ish it's not it's not like an exact thing every time like let me sit down and write a chorus there's a, a riffing on guitar but i'll sing a chorus with the riff writing a chorus like it's <laughs> uh let me ask you this because th these songs are obviously on your record are these songs that you write specifically for yourself or do you bring them to David Coverdale and Whitesnake or other bands and then you go, okay, it's not for this project. Let me go finish them later. Uh, how do you sort of differentiate between pile A and pile B, you know, uh, main gig, side gig, or if you want? Um, yeah, so they're usually, I'll, I'll usually stick them in categories, label them on my iPhone. Like if I just do a quick voice memo, if I write something. So like I said, most of these were written going about touring. If I told you for each one, it would be like an insane geography lesson, right? I mean, um, the, the, all over the world. So I, I'll pretty much know... All right, so this is this will fit in with a uh, Joel Hooker's thirteen album. So I always I definitely think about the personnel. I mean, you got Vinnie Appice on there and Russell Allen. So I I like to obviously have that do edge for the heavier stuff. It just makes sense with who who's working with me and it's stuff that I grew up on and love that stuff. And then I I also love that kind of more melodic bluesy or like foreigner kind of thing. And so that tends to be, that's the best I can describe this stuff is melodic hard rock, Dio ish at its heaviest, foreigner ish at its lightest. And there's times where other influences like poke their head out of the sand, you know, like I was a big Queensryche fan growing up and there's little moments where you'd be like, Oh, that, that, yes, I hear a little bit of Queensryche there. Well, I, uh, I hear Dio in finish line. I, I hear that first you're, you're doing like a metal a melody line or, or a Dio part. And then you just add a little flourish as goes, no, Hey, I'm not copying anything. It's kind of, you know, which is kind of yeah, weird. that, that one's as Dio ish as this stuff has ever gotten, but it's, uh, I mean, I, look, I, I feel like just wear my influences on my sleeve a little bit. What's the harm in that? That music is 40 years old now at this point. Let's fucking rock, man. Who cares? <laughs> That's fresh as anything to like. Sorry, sorry about my language. <laughs> no, we're, we're good. 
I mean, Jeremy's not not 30 yet, so he might be a little bit offended. I'm so offended by your language. I happen to have my young brother here with me, and I don't appreciate the kind oh. of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all right, let's, so, so let me get into uh, into the singing, because you, you do sing, and you do provide background vocals when you're, when you're on stage. Um, why bring in Russell and Jeff? Why not be the lead singer and really be a solo, solo project? Um, I mean, for me, I feel like I'd rather make a great album and I'm not a great singer. <laughs> so for me, it's like, uh, at the end of the day, I, I want to just release a great album. So that's, to me, that's more important than whether or not my ego is satisfied by being the singer, right? Or being like, I'm going to be the front guy. It's like, let's just, I just, I just want to have a great, that was from the beginning with this, when I put out Dying to Live in 2015, the intent was to just write a, be, write a rock album and, just real a solid rock album, not like right. a progressive, not trying to prove anything with like two minute guitar solos or three minute guitar solos, but just a solid rock album. But be the guy who gets to kind of call the shots, right? Be the guy who writes the songs and gets to say how the mix should be and all that. So, but just have it sound like a band. And that's where this is really different than a solo album, right? It's like right. if I said it's a solo album, people think, oh, he's singing or oh, he's playing. It's an instrumental album. With this, it's like it sounds like a band, but it's not a band because I write everything, including the lyrics and the vocal melodies. So I do sing the entire album really, really poorly for Russell. I mean, I, I lay down a guide vocal of me singing the whole album, and then he listens to it and probably laughs in private. Maybe plays it for his closest friends, and they have a laugh at my expense. And then he, he the sings. There's a box set at some point. But all right, let me hear, Go ahead. He, he sings. I, 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 yeah, and then he, and then he sings the entire record. And then my style with all these guys, because you know, obviously, I'm doing the writing, is just to stay hands off with the production. So if Russ wants to tweak something, if he's like, uh, I don't really like the way that's phrased, or this would lay but, better in terms of like actually singing it, he just does it, and no, I don't sure. care. I want that's to ask great. You, and I want to take over from because you're talking about it. It's a band, and it's just, you know, you're setting it up as a band. Is that something you have to be conscious with in a sense with, you know, David Coverdale is not going to go on forever. He's going to retire. Cher is not going to go on forever. She's going to retire and you're still going to be younger and still needing to work. Do you need to start setting up the, you know, getting the table ready for that eventuality? No, I mean, I'm setting this up as a project, not really as a band. That's hence the name. Yeah, it's kind of like a weird name. It's like, well, what is that? Joel Hoekstra's 13, right? Why not just call it Joel Hoekstra? Well, I told you why, because it's not a guitar album. I'm not singing. Sounds like a band, but I'm doing all the writing, so it's not a band, right? So these guys would be like, hey, what's the deal? You're giving us a band name when we didn't get to do any of that? So uh, the project name made the most sense. So that's where this that's where this lives. Now, we did do one live show on the Monsters of Rock Cruise in support of Dying to Live, so I'm not ruling out like some kind of like, hey, this can go out on the, you know, the road and do a little something sure maybe but are you at um, a point where you have to start thinking about the future because uh, i would think that Cher and david coverdale are, are 10 years and less and i don't mean that in any disrespectful way but uh, my mind always just kind of ticks in the moment and okay. my my whole thing is to be productive every day and then just kind of follow where life leads me that's how you end up doing weird stuff like being in Cher's band or being on broadway and rock of ages <laughs> anyway right i mean i was not 11 years old sitting playing black sabbath riffs going someday i'm going to be in Cher's band but like somehow you end up the life can take you to strange places when you just do your best every day with everything that life presents to you, right? So if somebody, you know, gives me, I mean, this is, I'm doing the best I can in this interview, right? It's the, the same th the way that we, everything so that hard. we... We're so hard to deal with. You guys are. You're incredibly difficult people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I hope you understand how hard this is for me to have to deal with you. But <laughs> just uh, just to get through... I guess everything that's presented to me the best I can it allows life to kind of take you to these places is my point. So being too specific and going like when you're saying, are you thinking about the future being like, so this is my plan five years from now when there's no more white, I'm not doing that. I'm just like doing the best I can. And I, life has a funny way of providing if you, I guess if you stay true to working hard right. and doing the best you can. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be like totally screwed and I'll be like, Mitch was right. I should have had a plan, damn it! Yeah, you know. No, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know, man. Think, no, because I, I just look around at Richie Faulkner and at Nita Strauss and at all these people that are in these bands that are on the verge of retiring, and you're like, where do you, where do you, where's the next step? 
And I mean, I, I have no idea. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, that could maybe lead to the uh, downturn of our scene, or it could make people like us, the, the people that were the additions or replacement player people, more valuable down the road. I have no idea. It could be either one. Oaks Dress White Snake brought to you. No, 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 no. Don't go there. <laughs> Don't go there. DC is the only one, man. <laughs> don't, don't even go there, man. Oh, that would be that would be uh, that would be hilarious. Uh, let me talk also in the marketing of this because you look at the press release and it says Joel Hoekstra, Trans Siberian Orchestra, and White Snake. The share is not mentioned at all. Is that something that you know you you don't want rock fans to know? Is it, I don't want to say is embarrassing, but it, like, why, why not just say, Hey, he's in these three major projects. No, I just, I debated about that a little bit. I, I put that together. I mean, they had me put it together and they didn't say anything to me about it. And I kind of just thought, you know, how it gets a little obnoxious sometimes when you see these people with like, you know, eight bands after their name. And it was like, maybe I should just <laughs> well, kind of limit what it is. I mean, I, am I, look, are Cher fans going to buy this album? Probably not. You know, they're, it's mainly going to be like White Snake fans that buy this album most, re right. most uh, likely. And TSO fans, too. TSO right. fans are hard rock fans. So, um, I mean, that's just, I guess, uh, from my. Uh, there, there you go. There's the thinking, right? There, there, try, there. try to avoid having like the eight bands and the, the here are the here are my ninety seven credits after my name, right? I mean, just where do you where do you draw the line? I got. Can you guys hear me? Because I'm having some weird technical issues on my side today. Yeah, I can I hear saw, you right now. Yeah, I saw that picture pop up. It was most impressive. Oh, thanks. I know. But we're back to the live shot. Yes. Starbucks. Well, let me ask you, you know, talking about the share thing, it's interesting. So, and you're a good guy to ask this question to, because I work in top forty radio. Okay. And then I do this podcast talking to guys like you and the rock guys and stuff. Right. Do you get any flack from any fans questioning your legitimacy? Saying, oh, you know, he's, you know, he loves Dio and he plays in White Snake, but he's playing in, you know, that pussy music, share, you know, like that's, that's not rock and roll. That's not metal. Like, do, do fans give you shit for that? Uh, I've seen a couple of them, but. It doesn't matter to me, man. Silly. I, one of the best things that ever happened to me was when I got out of GIT, right, in 1991 or whatever, back when the shred scene was alive and well, was Nirvana hit. And it was 1992, I guess. And I was like, boom. And so all the, like, hey, I built up my chops as a kid, that all just became kind of, like, pointless. And so it, la it launched this career for me of having to do anything and everything to be valuable as a guitar player. And I, that made me a better musician. So at the end of the day, man, people can say whatever they want. It's about, it's about being a good musician and being mm -hmm. about the music. And so, um, and that does involve playing different styles as far as I'm concerned. And, um, well, dude, I mean, you 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 go from being on stage and playing a song like If I Could Turn Back Time, which is equally as rocking and, as any White Snake song. Yeah. I'll agree. Go on. Go to play still of the night. It's like, I think it totally works. Well, I, as I said, life can surprise you with these things, right? I mean, there's, there's times where you're like, wow, really? Okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to do this. I, for me, I actually really enjoyed playing the share set because there was um, just decades of material that you'd pull from in that. So there was all these different styles. I mean, the Waka Chaka disco, yeah. uh, to playing R and B stuff to, I mean, so for me, that was great. And it gives me an opportunity to show people like, Hey, look, I had to do a lot of different things coming up in my career. I wasn't, um, just like a guy who uh, became famous at 21 years old and sold 5 million albums and like, you know, now I can just rest on yeah. my laurels right. because I'm who I am. Uh, for me, it was a totally different path. It was this path of like grinding and struggling as a guitar player and then having things suddenly just open up like later in my life, which is amazing and, and is great. But I still feel very much like I'd be just totally full of shit if I denied the fact that I'm a working musician. Like I'm a, I'm so, I, I feel, I feel like I've always been a creative artistic person too. It's not like I'm saying, you know, I'm all about the gig, man. You know, like I definitely enjoy like being an artist and being a creative individual as well. 
But I think there's a lot of people that fall in that category that have trouble like putting it all together and actually being able to make a living and get somewhere with it, right? When we're all young, there's like a gazillion people that are like, man, it's all about the art, man. That dude's a sellout, right? You know, and like, well, and that's, that's great. But all those people are like fucking working at Ford now, you know, or whatever. It's like, so... It, at, so, at some point in time, you got to be like, all right, yeah, I got to figure out a way to balance this. And for me, that was, you know, teaching and playing gigs. And it still is. I'm teaching right now and doing sessions for people. There's no shows. I mean, well, yeah. So, so how do you adjust in this current climate? Because I'm assuming touring with Cher and touring with Whitesnake puts bread on the table. So now what What are you doing? Like, are you in a panic mode yet? Or are you like, nah, I got, I'm good. I'm st- I'm fine. I mean, do you think prostitution is panic? I mean that. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, no, I, I basically, basically, uh, what I was talking about. I mean, I'm teaching 30 students a week, one on one, right now. I'm doing master classes for like rock and roll fantasy camp and some other outlets and uh, cameos, lots of those. I'd say 10, 15 a week, and uh, sessions. I, I tend to have about three or four a week for people. Oh, wow. I do solos on people's stuff, and uh, so that, that stuff, obviously, the album obviously doesn't, uh, it doesn't take away money per se, but uh, having that, and then I guess some of these other things are just kind of for kicks, you know, doing these quarantine videos with Dino Jalusic, and, and uh, I've, I've done a bunch of those along the way this year. So that that's more or less a, just to enjoy a little bit of relevance and a little bit of, well, I guess, you know, your pulse rate will go up two notches because there's a new <laughs> video of you online and like, what are people going to say, right? So uh, it's, man, just as long as I'm being productive and moving forward, I think that's what this whole thing is all about. And and the story of my life, and that's the only way I know how to go about doing this. And that's what got me where I am, man. I went from being just this guy in a suburban Chicago town from a pretty poor family growing up where I'm not supposed to be doing any of this stuff, um, just simply by never stopping and just by like always gigging and like I've had a lot of weird gigs, man. I mean, if I told you my full life story, I mean, do you guys know that I was the bass player for the Turtles? And I did that and, and, and played was playing Happy Together, singing the backgrounds. I mean, that was, there's, a, there's a strange story for me compared to most, you know, and like, hey. Like Kathy Richardson of, of, of Jefferson and, Starship and, Airplane. And, and, and uh, let me ask you this. In terms of your style, when you when you come to do Joel Hoekstra's 13, you come to do Weissney, is it just Joel's guitar playing or, or do you approach it differently? Do you, do you pick out different guitars? Do you, do you, do you string them? I mean, is it I'm Joel and this is how I play or do you adjust and adapt for every project? Oh, Joel. Oh, there you are. Are you there? Yeah. I, you have me still? We do. Did you hear the last question? Okay. Yes, I did. Uh, in breaks my microphone is all fritzy today it's it's a, it's a great know. interview so far and, and and the old man who's got the shit microphones has the best fucking technology it's fantastic um so i would say i adapt for every project i mean okay. there's there's got to be guidelines when you go into this stuff i mean and, and that for me it starts with the personnel on this right like who i'm playing with and like do i want to like go hey let's do a funk song you know like no we're not it's russell allen is Vinny app to see and like come on we're gonna we're gonna rock we're gonna we're gonna play some hard rock here and hopefully make it melodic along the way um so there's definitely guidelines and that's partially me and it's partially the label as well i mean they wanted me to hone uh to focus the sound a little bit better on this one compared to dying to live dying to live was uh, you know i'm really proud of that record i think there's a lot of cool stuff on there but it, it just it kind of became what it became as it went so I was I like, know. I'm going to be really heavy. I mean, I had like a bonus track that was like on the fringe of being like, you know, it was gang vocals and super killer be killed. And then there was all the way to like a song, like what we believe that was almost alternative. And, you know, uh, so there was a, a wide variety in that, which I, I happen to love myself. I mean, I love records that are all over the map that are like, hey, every song is completely different. But unfortunately, I'm way in the minority with that, man. You know, I mean. I think, which I get, like, if you're going to release like two singles off an album, you kind of want to be able to like, tell people like, Hey, this is what you, you can expect on this album. Yeah. Um, so the album and the sound of it. 
So when you're asking if I if I if this record is how I play, well, I'm trying to stay within certain guidelines, right? I think we always are. Everybody is that makes these records. So you'd probably get the same answer from everybody on that, truthfully. But I think the only difference is I've probably kicked around and played a lot of different styles compared to maybe most uh, for reasons I mentioned. Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Get, getting me uh, getting me to this point, man, I, which, I mean, I've done a lot of stuff, definitely. I mean, I was in, for a while there, I was in a hip-hop band, and we were opening for The Roots and <laughs> opening for uh, Ludacris and, and Kanye West. And, I mean, can you imagine that, that I was on a bill like that ever in your life? It sounds weird, right? And, um, really? And if you're a good musician, you can do it all. I've put out, uh, you know, my my instrumental fusion records, and I was in acid acid jazz bands along the way. I used to play sit on bass in a Motown like doo wop band in in the Chicago area. I've done a lot of gigs, man. You know, when, when is the black metal, the black death metal album coming out? You know, I used to sing. I sang without playing guitar in a thrash band called Fear Itself in the Chicago area. So there's, I think, uh, maybe one tape that exists somewhere in my world which i need to locate of me doing that but it was very pantera and it was me just singing not playing no guitar hey joel let me ask you you know playing in white snake is there a lot of competition between you and red beach because of the we uh, no like, no man red, like, red, like red, when red, you go red. down to your knees during a show does reb ever look over and say could you just stand up yeah, really? like, is there from <laughs> stand the fuck off? Are you doing all, you ever do that? Poses, all the poses, all the moves and everything. Like, does Rev look on the other side of the stage after the show and say, like, dude, like, can you tone it down stand enough? Stand the fuck up. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, he, he yeah, he probably, he probably uh, would love it. Uh, but it, it, we're, we're good. You know, I mean, I've never, Rev and I are not really, like, competitive. Friends, I would competitive. No, we're not. We're not competitive. I would say that. Um, no, we just do the we just do the gig, man. You know, Reb's a Reb's a pretty easygoing, very funny guy, super talented. Yep. Um, he's great to play rhythms with, and I don't mean that in any knock on his lead playing. He's everybody knows Reb's like a really great lead player, but um, he's really tight with his rhythms, and we do enjoy that about each other that we lock on the riffs yep. real tight. Um, He's a great background vocalist in the band as well. I mean, he sings really well. Uh, that's these are the things that people don't know about Reb. I don't mean to like you know, it's no slight on his chops, and he's awesome, you know. But yeah, uh, that Black Swan record he did with uh, Pilsen and uh, Macaulay was fantastic. Well, dude, that was your favorite I, album of uh, 2020, wasn't it? It was my favorite album of 2020. I, I saw, I, I saw that. You know, I actively follow you. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I might be a I'm, mistake. I, I'm always seeing what's what 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 you're tweeting and what's well, going that's on it. Problem. And that's so, why you get hacked because you. Yeah, it. I, I, Jeff Pilson and I were texting the other day, and I congratulated him on that. I said, "Hey, that's great. I saw that Mitch Lafon said the Black Swan <laughs> record is his favorite of 2020." It okay. was. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, uh, I, yeah, I only saw the Joel was playing on the record, but nah, well, nah. duh. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Uh, all good. You guys are stirring up controversy. Come on. Oh, uh, no, we're not. Well, but uh, let me just quickly, since we're on the White Snake thing, uh, the Blues album is coming out shortly. Did Did you have a chance to go in there and and add some muscle to it, like you did on on the Rock album and on the uh, what was it, Love Love album, Love songs? Love yeah, songs? the Red, White, and now we're on the Blue. Right. So the way that's working is that, you know, David had that record called Restless Heart that was out years ago. A fantastic and, record. Uh, yes. So I went in and ruined look that. that. No, no. Uh, right, look at that. There you go. Love songs. Beautiful. So, so David wanted to do a reimagining on Restless Heart. So he had Derek Sherini and Ed Keys, and he had me basically double what Adrian did with the Les Paul and add some overdubs. And so there's a remix of that that i think the whole thing is being released at some point but uh, on these compilation records there's been a little taste of that right. uh on there so i'm a very tiny part of the the compilation oh, okay so you're, you're, you're not on here i go again and is it love you, you didn't do the whole thing no that's just john sykes uh remixed on there that's all that is oh okay the mix on that because it sounds super fresh like almost like as if they were re-recorded parts and so yeah, chris did a really great. great job doing it and he also did your record, so you know. Is, I guess there's a similarity in sound in a way, you know. Yeah, Chris has a definite style that you can hear. So um, yeah, I think he he was recommended to me from uh, by Jeff Pilson, really. Jeff, so 
going back to Jeff, Jeff recommended Chris to me, and I thought he did a great job on Dying to Live and did a great job on running games. And uh, yeah, having him on for the White Tank stuff has been really great. I, I'm sure he's happy. David's had him super, super busy. Um, very talented guy, and he, he doesn't have uh, such a big ego that he won't work with me in terms of what it is that I want to hear, right? Sometimes mix engineers get to the point where they're like, take it or leave it, dude. Like, leave me alone. And I'm like just endless in terms of my, the minutia, you know, hey, dude, would you mind uh, this hi-hat is, uh, you know, I mean. It, dealing with an engineer and saying like, hey, could you, you know, maybe, you know, bring the guitar up or, you know, maybe you should lower the hi-hat or the percussion. And do you, you get like a snobby answer? Like, um, I'm the producer. I'm the mixer. You should trust me. I think there are, I think there are definitely mix engineers that take uh, a firmer stance against that kind of stuff than Chris does, is my point. So I guess he puts up with all my crap, and I appreciate that. So, Chris, if you're listening, love you, oh, dude. You know, it, listen, if you go, to a restaurant, <laughs> you go to a restaurant they don't cook your steak right, you're going to send it back. I mean, you're paying the bill at the end of the day, right? I think it's... I think it's foolish to have an artist spend as much time as we do tracking a song and working on it. And then that mix engineers feel like they can spend just a tiny bit of time on it and have you just go, Oh dude, perfection. You know I mean? It's like, I'm we just going to have this filter on it. There you go. No, actually, let me, just, let me ask you about that real quick. Uh, is that something that might interest you? Because uh, we were talking to uh, Jeremy and I about Steven Wilson from Porcupine Tree, who does all the mixing and stuff now. Is that something that might interest you going down the road, getting into the studio and being the guy behind the desk telling young bands, hey, do this, do that? I mean, do you want maybe, to Ezrin? Maybe. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I like, I definitely enjoy the art of um, engineering and, and producing. And so maybe, although right now it wouldn't be the, the ideal call. Time? Yeah, not the ideal time. Yeah. All right. But maybe down the road. You never know. Uh, like I said, sometimes life will surprise you. Go like, oh, wow, I ended up doing this. I, I like that method where, like, you just get surprised by these things. Yeah, well, cool. you, you, know, you know, you look at Mick Jones from Foreigner, because you mentioned Foreigner, and there was a time there where he was doing Stormfront, he was doing 5150, he was in there, and it's just like, oh, maybe Joel will be the next uh, Mick Jones. You know, oh, I mean, that, that would be like... <laughs> lofty that would exceed all expectations <laughs> man you know i'll t I'll, t I'll take uh, maybe a slightly more successful version of myself and be like cool i uh, good we're solid right, you'll so. be the next jeff pilson all right that's fine that's fine uh, no i mean that's <laughs> uh, that that's lofty too man jeff has had a hell of a career man i mean you know the doc and uh, career so see the thing is that you know guys years ago they sold millions of albums when's that going to happen now i mean realistically if you were a betting man do you think this new album running games is going to sell millions of copies you'd oh, need no. to be you need to be completely insane to think do that, you, that do you go into the recording process with the intention of selling records or is it just really a for fun thing for you is it a business venture what? to pay your bills or is it for fun 100 percent for artistic expression man and for like the legacy of my life and to be known as somebody who had more than you know more than a guy who had a couple gigs uh, so you, you want to be, have artistic output in your life and have leave behind things to be, you know, known for in your career, I guess, where you're like, it did this, did this, did this milestones. Right. So, uh, I mean, I do have, uh, instrumental albums that I put out years ago, just under my name, Joel mm -hmm. Hoekstra. And then this is the second one under this name. And obviously all the albums with the bands that I've been a part of with Night Ranger and White Snake. And, um, so, uh, I'm just trying to do do something more than be like, wow, that guy. Well, he just did, just played gigs. Like, you know, he had a lot of gigs. That guy. I just I just got to say, since you mentioned right, uh, Night Ranger, um, you did 24 strings and a drummer. The the live and acoustic thing, and uh, there's even a vo version of Boys of Summer on there. That's just that that is just a masterpiece, quote unquote, unplugged album. It's just it's fucking fantastic. Cool, that's man. That was all I want to uh, say. <laughs> that's all I want to say. I, I really enjoyed making that. I mean, I, I enjoyed that Night Ranger. We, we would play those acoustic shows fairly regularly, and that was a lot of fun uh, that we would uh, have a different gig and like, hey, we're, we're doing it acoustic this week. You know, I, I like to play acoustic, as you know. So, I mean, to have, have some of those gigs be that way, and it allowed us to hear our vocals a lot better, I'll tell you that much, man. You <laughs> take the, the full kit and the, the amps out of there. It was like, we started singing a lot better during those gigs. We'd be like, man, our harmonies are sounding mm -hmm. good. Everybody is it perfectly in tune and wow, listen when you're playing the tracks everybody sounds great <laughs> <laughs> now, never uh, you know thank god night ranger didn't do it white snake doesn't do it 
Never been a part of that, so no. thank Night goodness. Ranger, Night, Night Ranger is live, live. In fact, uh, they were playing in Florida over the weekend, a uh, big crowd, and, and I saw some video. They sounded great. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah great, great live band, man, for sure. Uh, for me, the Night Ranger albums back that they, they made back in the day were, because uh, I think they had pop poppier producers. They kind of, uh, they what's the i mean there's no pc version i just gotta say they wimped out the guitar tones a little bit back then right yeah, so you listen to the rhythms and they're not as tough as when you go to your night ranger live now you know brad plays with that massive tone and it's like wow so you go to hear them live and the power of it and the how hard it rocks usually is the thing that it sort of elevates it from those original recordings i think in my mind at least that's how i um that's how i would define hearing them live versus the the record so yeah, yeah great, and, live, great live band and they're super visual man jack and brad i i learned so much from those guys um having to hold down that that area of the stage and then my time with them I mean, I was just getting my ass kicked on stage by, by Brad when, we, when I joined the band. We'd be together playing the double solos, and I'd have my guitar high just staring at my neck, you know, like you do when you're kind of a newbie. And, and then I'd look up, and the entire audience would be looking at Brad. He's looking out and doing all his crazy moves with it, you know. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, you know. I'm just getting my ass kicked. I need to, like, up my game here. Yeah, so here, And I'll, uh, I'll finish on the, on the Night Ranger thing real quick. First of all, the, the show on the weekend in Florida, Brad didn't show up, so it was uh... – night ranger with i guess four people or one down which was kind of wow weird. wow that's probably the first ever right a night ranger show without brad gillis without that's probably gillis. amazing so if you go to facebook you can type in night ranger and find regular posts from this past weekend <laughs> and there's no jack uh, there's no brad and you're just like wow that's amazing oh, that's this, i mean i guess uh it's Jerry uh Kelly stepped up. what's the uh what's uh, the spinal tap line in this, this topsy-turvy world of rock and roll you know he's talking about carrying the the, the cricket pad or whatever i mean i think that's just uh that's uh it's amazing the so thing you'll end up doing jeremy what you need to check out is on the somewhere in california album from uh 2011 they i love that version. album. i was yeah, on they, the radio when that album came on i was playing that song Right, but they they uh, there's a bonus track that they only put out for Amazon, uh, Coming of Age. Uh, you know the damn Yankees yeah. with the, with them and Ted Nugent, and and the guitar part there is just so fucking great. Anyway, oh I I see his next interview is coming in. So, I've got one coming in. I'm so sorry, guys. That's all right. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, lots of fun. Total pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Cool, I, I I look forward to the horrible clickbait headline that uh, that comes from this, Mitch. <laughs> It won't be me. I don't do those. Well, if Blabbermouth doesn't do it, I'll do it for us. Awesome. Let's can we maybe we mutually agree on something really, really bad, you know? We'll pull let's pull the worst thing we can from it, you know? Maybe if I say something controversial out of context right now, we could just use that and Yeah, go for it. Just say something. Anyway, yes, I have uh Thank you. I have three months to live. Yes. There we go. Yes. There we go. Good. Now we can, now we can say that. Now, if I do die in three months, that's going to be an amazing <laughs> moment in rock history. Oh, uh, now go tweet that. <laughs> all right, all right, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Have a good one. Oh, all right, Jeremy. That was uh, oh. that was fun. That was super fun. Joel's awesome, man. That was, uh, yeah. that was really cool. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I apologize for my technical difficulties through the interview. I don't know what the heck's going on. Well, you know, it's so funny. We joke about this all the time. I've got, you know. <clears throat> Even my voice is going now. So I've got, you know, the lights. I've got the nice <laughs> webcam. I've got the TVs. I've got the whole set. I've got, you know, $1,000 microphone and the boards and everything. And you just got a shitty blue Yeti sitting on your desk. And you, you sound Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you sound way better than I do. It's it's so annoying. Oh, God. You but, know, when you buy a, a dishwasher or a washing machine, they always say buy the one with the less buttons because when it breaks, it's cheaper to fix. And normally it doesn't break because there's less technology involved. Yeah, exactly. I think you need to. I think you need a new dishwasher. I'm gonna have to dumb it down a little bit. I mean, it doesn't get dumber than a freaking roadcaster. This thing's dumb as anything. But clearly, you can tell get, by my get sound. A, get, a, get a little uh, headphone for like a call <laughs> well, center how, headphone. How do I sound right now? To me, it's sounding muffled. But I don't sounds know. muffled. But how? There. I'm right there in the go. mic. Do there I sound better go. now? Yeah. Do but, Do I actually sound better now? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe it's me. It's, it's not. It's just it not coming you. in. Maybe it's not coming in. It's Hold not on. coming let, in clear. Let me turn off my uh, my processing. How does how does this sound? Does this sound any better? Hello. That sounds that, that sounds like a normal conversation to me. 
Oh, wow. Okay. So maybe I'll just keep my radio processing off it then. That could be. Anyway, uh, there we go. How about and, if I uh, move back a little bit? Can you hear me back here? Does it still sound normal? Clear? Can you hear me now? 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Checking for proper modulation. Check one, two. Proper modulation. Anyways. All right. Checking so. for proper modulation. <laughs> So what's Joel's solo album called? Joel Hoekstra's 13? It is called Joel Hoekstra's Joel Hoekstra, 13 Running Games, uh, available uh, in uh, February from uh, Frontiers Records. Frontiers Records. Buy it now where music is sold. <laughs> exactly. That, that could be their jingle. I'll sell that to them. There you go. So uh, before we start, well, we, we can stop recording if you want, but uh, just between you and I, uh, send it to me and tell me how you want to release it. I'll do the whole, uh, you know, here's the unreleased, unedited version. But let, yeah. let's, you want to coordinate? You well, you release the, the the full version first and I do unreleased well, later? Or I mean, I'm still recording, so maybe the fans will decide. Fans, what do you think? Who should get this first, uh, Mitch? Or... or we can choose a day together. I'm Like I said, I'll, hold on, wait. Let me just push stop because, you know, you're going to have to edit this out.